Hello, class. Uh, just wanted to make sure you guys had all the notes um, since I will not be in class today. So starting off with Jim Crow laws here, wanted to talk to you guys about those. That's where we left off on the notes in class. Jim Crow laws were laws created throughout the South to try and maintain dominance for whites and start repressing uh, African Americans. Once Reconstruction had ended, you start to see these get passed without very much pushback at all um, from the Republicans and the National Congress because they had kind of lost interest in Reconstruction. So what are different methods that they used that were considered Jim Crow laws? First and foremost, violence. We've talked about that method quite a bit. Intimidation and violence to scare African Americans um, away from voting. They were disenfranchised, whether that was standing by the polling place with a gun, uh, actually hanging somebody uh, outside the polling place, burning crosses in people's yards the day before elections. Whatever the method may be, they would use violence to try and lower voter turnout. Next, you have a poll tax. A poll tax is a simple idea. You have to pay to be able to vote. Um, the concept is the idea that you only want contributing members of society to vote. Well, if you can't pay a tax of, let's say, you know, modern, modern tax would be the equivalent of like 20 bucks or 30 bucks. If you can't afford that, you shouldn't have the right to vote. Well, a lot of these, these African Americans in Reconstruction, they don't have any spare money. They can't afford to do this. So they end up losing their right to vote because they can't pay the tax. Now, the one thing with the poll tax is everybody loses their right to vote if you can't afford it, whether you're black, white, anything. So it's not a black code. It's not a law only affecting blacks, saying if blacks can't pay this tax, they can't vote. It affects a lot of poor whites as, lo as well to get disenfranchised. Next, you have literacy tests. Literacy tests is the concept that you have to be able to read to vote. But a lot of the literacy tests were very, very difficult. In a lot of states, you would not have to take the literacy test if you had other qualifications, like your grandfather could vote. And we'll get to that in a second. Next, we have a secret ballot. Okay, Now, a secret ballot is something we value in the United States today. When you go to vote, you, you register so they know that you voted. But nobody has any idea who you voted for. It's totally secretive. So you could have voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and told everybody that you voted for Hillary Clinton or Harambe or whatever you wanted to say because we have a secret ballot. Jim Crow laws, if you had a secret ballot and there was no record of who you voted for, what you started to see was people take advantage of that by saying, okay, we had 1,300 people vote. Okay, and we're going to go through them and we're going to find uh, 300 votes for the Republican candidate, remove them and just replace them with Democratic votes. And nobody will ever know because there's no name on them. There's no record of figuring out who voted for who. So they could taint the vote. They could they could fraudulently change the vote without really being questioned because there was no technology to support this either. It was just paper ballots. Six is grandfather clauses. This is one of the most uh, overt ways that they just directly affect blacks, which is if you had a grandfather that voted, you can vote. If you had a grandfather that didn't vote, you have to pass a literacy test and pay a poll tax or whatever. So this might affect some people that move into new states because it might be a state law, like in Louisiana. Um, but the thing is here, if, you were, if your grandfather was a slave, they definitely didn't vote. So it might have affected a certain number of white voters, but affected all black voters. And then last, we have an all-white primary. A primary election is the election to choose the candidate running for office. The 15th Amendment was very specific in saying that blacks ha black men have the right to vote. But it didn't say anything about them voting in primary elections. So states started to pass laws saying that the uh, um, parties, political parties, could host primaries. And since those were not being ran by the state, they could be all white. So if only white people could choose the candidates running for office, guess how many black people they chose to represent them? Zero. So that el virtually eliminates any black candidates from being able to run for office when the two major parties have primaries where it's only white people voting. Okay, so let's look at some examples here. What is this an example of? Spell backwards, forwards. 
Print the word boat upside down, but in the correct order. Please place a cross over the 10th letter in this line. A line under the first space in the sentence and a circle around the last the in the second line of this sentence. Draw a figure that is square in shape. Divide it in half by drawing a straight line from its northeast corner to its southwest corner. Then divide it once more by drawing a broken line from the middle of its western side to the middle of its eastern side. What is this an example of? A literacy test. And look at the numbers, 20, 21, 22, and 23. A lot of times these, these tests could be 25 to 50 questions long of just trying to trick them. And if you miss two, three, four, five, you'd be disenfranchised. So there, not only is it trying to see if you can read, it's trying to trick you into failing it. Um, here's from Mississippi State Constitution. No male person who was born on January 1st, 1867, or at any date prior thereto, entitled to vote under the Constitution or statutes of any state or United States, wherein he then resides, and no son or grandson of any such person, shall be denied the right to register and vote. So if you were born in the United States, uh, you can you can vote, okay, if your son or grandson now shall be denied the right to vote register and vote in the state by reason of his failure to possess the educational or property qualifications prescribed by this constitution. It's a grandfather clause, it's a property test, and it's a literacy test. Here's an example of a cartoon using good old-fashioned intimidation and uh, violence. Um, of course he wants to vote the Democratic ticket. Remember, Democrats were opposed to Reconstruction. So you see in this example that whites were intimidating black voters. And look how the effect that it has on America. Black voter turnout at almost 95% in 1876 drops to 15% by 1896. In a 20 year period, voter turnout drops um, an absolutely astounding amount for blacks. Now, the other thing to notice here is that it drops for white voters too, because this does disenfranchise a lot of poor, uneducated white voters. Now let's talk about a Supreme Court case that's very important to American history. In 1896, the Supreme Court decided the case Plessy versus Ferguson. Homer Plessy was an African-American who was one-eighth African-American and seven-eighths white. He went to go get on the all-white rail car and informed the railroad driver that he was actually one-eighth African-American. They told him he needed to go to the all-black car. He filed a lawsuit against, uh, saying this was a violation of his 14th Amendment equal protection under the Constitution. The Supreme Court accepted the case and ruled that there was no 14th Amendment violation because the races were separate but equal. And that's where that infamous phrase comes from in American history that leads to segregation of all aspects of American society. So the slaughterhouse cases started off allowing intimidation and segregation. Plessy v. Ferguson makes it the law of the land. Separate but equal becomes true in water uh, fountains, in bathrooms, in schools, in restaurants, in movie theaters, in swimming pools, in libraries, in all aspects of the South. So that's the important aspect of this case, establishing separate but equal. And you see it all over the place. Okay. Now let's talk about three African-American leaders that sought for reforms. Start off with Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was the favorite of whites because Booker T. Washington was uh, accommodated whites' slow integration and slow acceptance of blacks. He believed that blacks needed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And the best way for them to be accepted by whites was to keep quiet, lay low, and work their tails off. And then over time, decades after decade after decade, if blacks were educationally equal, financially equal to whites, They'd be treated as equals to whites. And he believed that in the meantime, they needed to not cause any trouble. Then you have W.E.B. Du Bois. He disagreed strong with Booker T. Washington. He criticized Washington's stance so that African Americans have equal rights, so they should demand those equal rights. Lastly, Ida B. Wells. She was a woman who wrote passionately against lynchings and had seen and witnessed lynchings in her home state of Tennessee. She uh, was threatened frequently. She traveled the country and the world speaking out against violence and American segregation. That's it for our note page. I hope this helps you study for your test. We'll see you on Black Day.